Hey, how are you doing? Um, believe it or not, this is the beginner's talk for this particular session. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, I thought you might like to see the URLs here in case you want to download any of those and follow along interactively. Uh, otherwise, you can just you know, pay attention to me. I like it. How to define data types? Well, you probably have seen a little bit of this at least, even if you're a, a beginning Haskell programmer. Um, it's just basic Haskell 101. How do you define data types? Well, you use the data keyword or new type if you want to be fancy. And then, then you give a name for your type. And then maybe if you want to get really fancy, some type parameters here. And then an equal sign. And then one or more of these. Data, con data constructors. And this thing, if you want to get crazy, and we're not going to talk about that, I promise. Um, and then you have some types for that talk about the data that you want to put in each data constructor. Or maybe you have braces, and you have the funny little record syntax that sort of half works in Haskell and is not great and keeps encouraging people to propose things that aren't actually any, any better. But either way, you end up with your type definition. And you, you pretty much have to learn this right away if you're going to do Haskell. Um, but it's one thing to know about each of these syntactic things. Well, notwithstanding the little for all thing that I promised you that we were not going to talk about. Uh, but it's another thing to know when you want to use them. Like, when you want to use either, instead of define your new data type, when you want to introduce new type parameters, how do you want to introduce type, new type parameters? Um, what kinds of type class instances should you write? Uh, what shortcuts can you follow to make it easier to use your data type? And that's what we're going to be talking about in a set of rules. Uh, well, not so much rules as rules of thumb. You know. Just basic tips to keep in mind. And the, co the source code repository has examples of how you actually apply these tips. So you can take a look at that later. Uh, this, is, this just lays out the tips. We're gonna, there are nine of them. We're going to be talking about all of them, hopefully. I think I have time. So uh, it, it's not, it's, for a few of the tips, depending on where you are in your, as a Haskeller, it's not going to be entirely clear what exactly is going on. And that, that's OK. The reason these are rules of thumb is that you can more or less just blindly apply them. And you'll do these things, some of these things. It's like when you're talking to uh, maybe someone who's teaching you Haskell, and they say, do this, this, and this. And you're not really sure why, but you do it anyway because you trust that other person uh, who's teaching you Haskell. I mean, you should trust them. They're teaching you this great programming language. and. You just do them, and later on, you gain a deeper appreciation of why you should do them. Um, and we're only going to be touching on some of that. Uh, if you can follow on the reasons uh, why you should do these things, uh, great. If you don't, well, just, you know, just, just soak in it. So there's a big refactoring focus here. And, I know you, and especially, you're not going to run into this right away, but as a new Haskell programmer. But you're going to write some code, and then later on, you're going to realize, oh, I did that completely wrong. I have to reorganize this. And I have to reorganize that. No one gets it right the first time. So you want to be able to reorganize your code like this. Um, so some of the tips here, about half of them, are deal directly with making it easier to refactor your code later. If you follow these tips now, it's easier to fix things later. So let's take a look at our first rule. You should treat. Adding type parameters like, like you treat adding function parameters. They're ways that you abstract your types instead of your functions. Um, use them judiciously, because there are interesting things you can do with them. So here we have just this thing that represents a, I don't know, a, a response for some sort of internet protocol. Uh, you got a status, which is an int, because we're lazy. And you've got a headers, which is a list of header things, which is just unit, because we're lazy. And then content, which is a list of string for no particular good reason. So you decide to abstract uh, what content is. And 
there are various reasons for doing this, and won't. Get, I mean, it's the same kind of. Th re it's the same reason that you add arguments to your functions because you want to be able to say different things instead of just always having the same thing. There are things that we get even if we don't know uh, that we want different things, and we'll see that in a second. But this is a pretty straightforward uh, addition. All we've done is taken this list of string out, and we've replaced it with the A that we added as the type parameter. And so let's say we have this function. Your, your, your data goes through functions. It can sort of start out in a particular way, and then it flows through the functions that you define, and it ends up in the state that you need it to be in. So here's an example, clean up headers. And it does something to the headers field, right? Maybe it looks at the status code and decides that these, these headers are invalid for this particular status code or something or it does some other transformation. It doesn't really matter. It's, all we have here is just the idea of, of messing with the headers some. All right. The problem here is that we like type safety, and this type says that we can change the content in the response. That is, the response content can be different from the input content. But if we use the version of the function down here, all right, so we added a type parameter to the type, but instead of putting list of string here, we put the type variable. Now, this type variable means that we can't modify the content in our response. The res this type says that the response has to have the response response, the response that comes out of the function, has to be the same exact content as the content that we use as the argument here. And that's because it's just A. You don't know anything about A. You can't do anything with A. You can do lots of things with lists of strings. You can reorder the list. You can reorder the strings in the list. You could sort them alphabetically. You could send them to uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk and get someone there to sort them. You can't do any of those things with, uh, with just an A. You don't know anything about it, so you can't do anything with it. So you know that what you get back out has to be what you put in. And so you can use type parameters, among their many other uses, as a way to isolate your concerns at the type level. You can say, well, this, this function that I have only works on this part of my data structures. And it can't work on the other parts of my data structures because they're all type parameterized out. With something like that A, maybe you use more than one. Because if one per type parameter is good, then two type parameters has to be even better. And three type parameters, well, let's just write out. So we can do other interesting things here. <coughs> the, other, the other nice thing that we want to be able to do, I've seen a lot of processes that, have you ever seen a Java class where like all the methods return void? And they just initialize parts of the data structure. And it's totally arbitrary. And if you reorder it, the compiler will just let you, but the thing will blow up at runtime because, oh, you didn't initialize them in the right order. That's terrible. If you have a type parameter, you can change the type of your data structure as you go through from phase to phase. We say A here because we ignore it. That this, in this context, it basically means that the, the A basically means that we ignore the input because the A doesn't appear anywhere in the output. But here we can say, well, we started out maybe with a list of string, but we ended up with an I/O of list of string, and then we could pull the I/O out late, uh, later, and that's actually very easy boilerplate. We can just abstract all that away too, uh, but we'll see that later. So each phase of your program, as it modifies and builds up these data structures, can change the type to represent the thing that you're doing, like, like where you are in the process of building up the, the process that you're doing. So let's take a look at number two. All right, there's an interesting trick you can do once you start introducing type parameters, which is do funny things to the places where you've put your type parameters. There are two particular values of interest. 
unit and void. So unit has one value, right? So if we put unit here, if we put unit in the type, then there's only one value that we can put for content, which is unit. So it basically means that the, the content is relevant in that case. So you can trivialize data uh, with unit. And that's very simple. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. There's a more interesting possibility as well. And it's in this library called void. So void is an interesting data type. It doesn't quite fit the mold of the syntax of data type definition that I showed you in the second slide, which is that we just say data void, and there's no equal sign, and there's no data constructors for it. That's because void is uninhabited. There are no values of type void. So if we substitute void in for our A in the response data structure, that has an interesting effect. Say our, so I've added this other data constructor. We have a status only, and we also have a response in this case. Well, if I say void is A, A is void, then content must be void. There are no values of type void. Therefore, there is no way to construct a response, which means that this data constructor has been eliminated. So it's another example of changing types. By saying that in this, if, by saying that a values of type response three of void, we say essentially it can only be the status only. So we can not only change the types of data that go in our type parameters where they appear in our in our data type definitions, we can also wholesale eliminate uh, data constructors just by implication. OK, uh, this is probably the most important thing you can do uh, when you're defining new uh, data types for wide use. Provide as many instances as makes sense. Now, this is the main thing that you will see if you take a look at Edward Komet's code. It's like a data type definition and then just a whole mess of instances. And you have no idea what most of them are for, but that's OK, because the whole point is uh, the whole point of this philosophy is that, for most most part, uh, Ed doesn't know why he's defining these particular uh, class, uh, type class instances. He just does it because he assumes that maybe someone uh, will want to use it at some particular point, and it makes sense for this particular type, so why not? And a lot of this is easier than it sounds like. You don't have to necessarily know how to do a lot of these in order to get going. So we, have four stand, we, are, we are deriving four standard derivable instances here. Uh, show, read, eq, ord. And you want to know at least the six standard ones, which are those four and also um, bounded and enum. And there's a link somewhere in this file uh, that says how you can define them. Uh, this, this quote here, which I'm not going to read, is about Ed getting mad about somebody not defining enough instances. Don't make Ed mad. Define the instances. So in this case, we've done something very simple. Well, relatively simple. We've said, we've also said, in addition to the standard ones, we've said functor foldable traversal. Because our response is actually all those three type class uh, has those instances, they're legal instances. That is. Our response is actually traversable. And you think, well, that's dumb. Why would you want to traverse over the single value? Well, and for one example, when we had response of IO of list of string earlier, that's a straightforward way to just pull that IO out. You, traver you, you run sequence. You call the sequence function on the output of that uh, thing. And it pulls the IO out and pushes the response into it. And maybe you don't know why you'd want to do that up front, but what does it cost you to put functor foldable traversal in, the, in there, traversable in there? Not much. You just say them, basically. You import them up there at the top, and you put those three little language things. All this is just boilerplate. You can copy and paste it from this repo. 
You also want to provide other instances. Um, in this case, we define hashable. Well, I don't know if I want to hash responses yet, but who cares? Maybe someone will. So just define it. It's not that hard. It's even easier than this, but we'll get into how we can make it absolutely trivial uh, later. All right. You want to be careful about what your last one or two type parameters are, because they're meaningful for when you're defining type class instances. In fact, one of the reasons to define a bunch of type class instances up front is that it will tell you what the order of type parameters you should use is. Uh, last. OK. So let's look at a few examples, because there's no to really know this, you have to know some things about the type classes that are available. So, first of all, we have that the functorable thing should always be last, because technically, there's a functor over the A type parameter here, and there's a functor over the B type parameter here. But the way Haskell is designed, we can only define the one on the B parameter. So, we want to be careful that, if it matters, that the one that we put in the last place is the one where it will most commonly be useful uh, for client code that's working with this data type uh, to use the functor operations, fmap, and so on. Just a simple definition. We define a functor. See, we can't transform the A, but we can transform the B. Now, if you're defining a monad transformer stack, you want to put an, an M as the second to last type parameter. And then you have a, a final type parameter which represents your functorable thing. Because that way you can define monad trans, which if you are not going to work with monad transformers, you don't need to worry about that. But they're nice. You probably should. OK. If you're working, if you're defining a data type that looks like, looks functiony, like this one, this is like, this is, this is IO loader of R and A is just a glorified function of R to IO of A. It's like R is the, is the input, and then we do some IO, and we give back an A. Uh, so if we organize them in this way, we have, the, we have the output last, and we have the input second last, we can define instances like profunctor and category. And OK, what's profunctor? Don't worry, don't worry too much about it. You know, it's, the definition is straightforward if you have an input and output. Here we, we basically just, just compose functions until it works. All right. So conversely, to the type parameters at the end uh, having special meaning, when you add new type parameters, you want to add them to the beginning. And this is important for refactoring because when you do it this way, You can pretty much mindlessly replace everywhere that your type name appears with something that adds in whatever the default value that you want for that type parameter is. So in this case, we're replacing string with a in new input parameter type variable. Here, i. All right. So all we have to do is replace wherever we see parser as a type with just parser of string, our original value, in parentheses, mindlessly, here, we've replaced parser with parser of string, and we're done. Now, uh, so here, we have a type class instance here. We replaced it. The parentheses are important. Without the parentheses, this would not work. And we also do that here. But of course, in this context, the parentheses are redundant, so we could clean it up later. And we, that, you can split your work up. You want to do the mindless part first, which does a lot of the work for you, just doing the, the global type replace. Then you can go back and say, OK, well, this part doesn't need parentheses. And in fact, for that functor, for that functor uh, we don't need to say stream there either. We can just have a type variable, and that will work too. But all, you, all that you can just worry about later. Um, once, once the basics work, just the mindless part of the refactoring. Uh, incidentally, this also applies to functions. If you add new 
arguments to the beginning of a function call, you can do the same kind of replacement for wherever you see the function being called in your code. But uh, again, it only works for when you're adding arguments to the beginning. OK, again, in the category of mindless derived type class instances. We have a new set of import, imports. So you want show because, well, maybe like philosophically, you don't want to be able to show, you don't want to be able to convert your type, values of your type to a string. And you know, that, that's OK. But maybe you want to show them at the REPL, or maybe someone else using your library will want to show them at the REPL to see what's going on and get really mad at you because you didn't provide a show instance. And so when they try and print out what you have, they can't print it out. So j just throw show in there if it works. But there are also three others that are kind of weird. And I've only worked with them a little bit. So I don't even know nearly everything that you can do with them. But again, the, the point of this setup is just that you can do these things and figure out why you're doing them later. So in this case, you put data typeable and generic in your, in your um, derived type class instances. And those require other uh, GHC extensions at the top there. See, so derived data typeable and derived generic have been added to our functor foldable traversable triad. So you can derive these up front, and maybe you don't know why you'll use them, but you'll find weird uses for them, like this one. So now that we have derived generic, uh, when we say that we want a hashable type class instance for this, we can't derive it. But what we can do is just say what the instance should be, and our instance will be written for us. And that just works because we derive generic for a type. And so data typeable and generic, because they're part of scrap your boilerplate, they're part of generic Haskell programming, will show up in weird cases. And you don't have to plan for any of them up front. You don't have to know what all they all are. You can just derive the three type classes and let someone else figure it out, maybe. And maybe that'll be you later on when you're a Haskell expert. OK, if you have a complicated uh, hierarchy of data types, you want to separate records and unions. So let's just take a look at what that means. So here we have a record, which is two or more things connected to each other. And then we have a union, which is like an or of one thing each. And this is what I mean by separating records and unions. If you have more than one thing, split it off into a separate data type. I mean, yes, Haskell will let you have more than one thing for each case for each data constructor of your type definition. But if your hierarchy is complicated enough, it's not that much of a load cognitively to add in uh, new data type definitions. And that gives us access to better tools for dealing with the, any complexity that we might accidentally be introducing by adding more types. I mean, our hierarchy was complicated enough, you might say. But, but we're going to take a look at why doing this lets you uh, manage your complexity much better. For one thing, this helps with refactoring. So if we listed more things here at response, we can't take a chunk of code that deals with the response data constructor and split it off into a separate function that says response, because response isn't a type. It's a data constructor here. Response for is a type. Now, if we have them separated like we do in this code, we can split off part the function that deals with complete response, because we can talk about the type of the data that goes into this specific data constructor. So that's one way in which it helps. But if we're using lens, which we are here, and here we're just using template Haskell, 
and some other things. Uh, again, you don't really have to know about these. The way that I did this was I put in template Haskell and I put in the boilerplate make classy and make classy prisms. And then I just, I just added language things to the top until it worked. Because when, it, when I didn't have enough, it would tell me. Uh, perhaps you wanted to add language multiparam type classes. Well, yes, GHC, I did want to add multiparam ty type classes. Thank you for being so helpful. So once we have the, the, we have our classy and our classy prisms working, uh, then we can do weird stuff with lens. Lens, use it. You don't have to learn the whole library up front. You can just learn a couple little tricks here and there, like this particular one. OK, so we have a foldable, which could be like a list or a tree or whatever, uh, that has some responses, response fours in it, just our data that we have right at the top there. And we want to pull out all the things that are complete responses. So first of all, by separating our into records and unions, we've gained the ability to talk about just this particular data constructor as a separate type. And secondly, by lensifying everything, we've gotten an operation which is filter for this particular type, for this particular case, for free. All right? And that's just like this. If we say caret dot dot folder dot underscore response, where response is the name of the data constructor we want, we're basically saying, walk through this data structure, find every response, and give me the data from it and put it in a list as the output. So we got a filter for free. We don't have to write anything. Uh, the, the, alternate, the alternative is really messy here, alternative to using um, lens. And we can do a lot better than this. You, you can arbitrarily stick together things that talk about how exactly where you want to drill down into your data structure and do this kind of filtering that way, because lenses and prisms compose here. So we also have, we can also drill down deeper. We can say, OK, in the case where I have a response, I want to get the content field from it. OK? Uh, but of course, we don't know whether we have a response case if we just have a value of type response for. So we really get a maybe. And if we put caret question, and then the thing with the underscore, and then the field that we want, then we just get that operation for free as well. So about the, that little magic right there, make classy and make classy prisms. Especially if you have complicated data type definitions, you should absolutely be doing this. And once again, you don't have to, OK, we've got kind of a ridiculous tower of language uh, things now. But we'll talk about that in a second. Ignore the, the theme behind the curtain, as I say. So if we have a record, we want to do something like, you want to put the name of your type at the beginning, typically, because that name is also going to be created by, by uh, the make classy system. So we have our response type. We have our three fields. We have a whole ton of derivations. And we say make classy, quote, quote, in the name of the type. And that's all you got to do. And then you know keep going, because then GHC will tell you that you need to say language this, and you need to say language that, and so on. So once I, if, if I do this, one thing that I get, in addition to all the other things that you get with Lens, is the ability to embiggen my data structures. Let's say that sometimes I want to talk about just a response, and sometimes I want to talk about the pair of a request and a response. Well, every request and response has a response in it. So why is it that we can't just talk about the response content of a request response? Well, if we use a lens, then we gain the ability to transform our functions that deal with responses to automatically work with request response pairs as well. And th this is just the kind of mundane refactoring that you get when you start needing, needing uh, different data in different places as you build your program. But if we use lens in advance, and we talk about our fields in our, in our record by using lenses, then we get these capabilities. So here, what we do is that we say, OK, a, a re request response has a response in it. This is boilerplate. 
Never mind the blob behind the curtain. Now we have some response, and we can, we can get the content out of both the response by itself and also the request response in exactly the same way, caret dot response content. And this applies to all the other fields, and it applies as many la layers down as you like. Yeah? Uh, has response. Uh, that's defined for just a response up in the make classy macro? Or? Yes, make classy de defines a default instance for that. And because there's so much weird stuff that's going on, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the haddock that got generated from this one. And I want that one. And I want that one. OK. So here. So we got, we got all the things that, that we derived here. And we also got has response, response of A and A. And we'll take a look at that has response. So that's the one that you were talking about. Um, a response has a response trivially, basically. So here's the class that make classy defined for us. Um, don't worry too much about that. We, d we got the ability to talk about responses. By default, that's just a response has a response in it. But we also know that a request and response has a response in it as well, uh, which is what we defined uh, explicitly with, by instantiating it has a response. And we also got these lenses. So we got the one that you define, and we got the ones that talk about the fields inside. Now, another reason to use classy is that it makes it really easy to export these things. So we're using these underscores because you have to use the underscores to get make classy to work. Um, but let's say we want to hide those, those original record names and we only want to export the lenses from our, from our uh, module. Well, that's really easy with make classy. So we say the name of the type and just the names of the data constructors that we want to export. We don't mention the record fields at all. And then we say what the, what the lensy class name is, what the classy lens name is. What it, it, the classy lens class name. Yeah. Um, and then put two dots. And now we've exported exactly what we want to export. So the, the converse of that is make classy prisms. So it's a pretty simple formula. You put underscores, you put the name of the type, and you say make classy for your record types. You just do it normally, but typically only have one thing per uh, data constructor. You can have more, and then you get tuples, but that's not cool. And then you say make classy prisms for your union types. So make classy for record types, make classy prisms for union types. Uh. OK. So the way that we deal with that huge tower of, of uh, language extensions that we now need to, in order to do all of these things, uh, that's not right. We want this one. Yeah. So we've got a huge tower. Let's see. We've got five that are related to deriving. And then we've got three that are related to, um, to classy. So that's, that's getting a little excessive. And also the fact that we're using template Haskell means that you have to order things in a weird way. So now what you want to do, especially if you're just coming to Haskell and you don't want to have to deal with having all these weird extensions that you don't know they're for um, running already in your ordinary code, because they can cause confusing errors. If you, if you, define, if you use a language extension in a file of yours, um, then the errors that you get are going to be weirder than the ones that you get with just standard Haskell. Standard Haskell is, is much simpler than the language that you get by defining all of these language extensions. So typically, you want your type definitions uh, to I be isolated from your ordinary functions working on the data types that you've defined, because that way, your ordinary code can only be using the extensions that your ordinary code needs. And there's another reason to do this as well. If you hide all of your data constructors, you're going to annoy Ed. All right? I've seen this happen. All right? There are people that hide too much in their, uh, 
in their libraries that they publish on Hackage and are not responsive enough. Now, let me be clear. Uh, anything less than responding in a day is not responsive enough for Ed. There's no one who is more responsive than Ed when it comes to maintaining Haskell packages. If you are not responsive and he, for a package and he needs something from your package, he will steal your package from you. All right? And, and he will be a better maintainer and you'll feel miserable about it. <laughs> you don't want to feel miserable. So don't annoy Ed with your de definitions, especially if you're going to make something useful that he might want to use. Now, if you're making something useless, he's not going to want to use it anyway. So go ahead and publish it on a hackage however you want. But if you're going to make something useful, Ed might want it. And if you, if you hide too much from him, then he's going to want to steal your package from you. So don't hide your type definitions, even if it's the standard ML or OCaml cool thing to do. If you want to hide them anyway, Put them in an internal module. Everyone knows what this means. Yes, you're exporting your, your data constructors and all the details, all the messy nonsense that's in, supposed to be internal to your data structures. But you're saying it's an internal thing. So it's, it's your own fault. It's your own fault if you rely on these things and we change them out from under you. All right? So give an example, popular package. All right? He's trying to use this text thing, but he hasn't been able to use it because the functions that, he, that, uh, that were written in the, in the library were not good enough for Ed. So I want you to ask yourself this. And I mean, it doesn't matter where you are on the learning Haskell uh, spectrum, you know, beginner, expert. Are your functions good enough for Ed? All right? If you can't answer an unqualified yes to this, question. And please, if you can answer an unqualified yes to this question, you should talk to me because maybe we want to hire you. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're a normal person, um, not, not a freaking genius, then uh, maybe you want to consider the possibility that someone will want to put in a whole ton of effort making a better function than you've written for your data type. So if you lock someone out of the internals, you're going to write a nasty email to the Haskell mailing list talking about how you're a bad maintainer. You don't want that. We're all for a clean API, as Ed says, but a clean API that blah, 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 complex stuff um, invites a lot of reinvention. So. If everyone else follows this, this rule and you follow this rule, then maybe you, you failed to, Im, to define some type class instances. But if you defined all of, if you made all of your data t constructors public, even if they are an internal module, at least you are providing the possibility for someone to define the instances or the functions that they need without stealing your package out from under you. Or just re-implementing it into oblivion, which also has happened. Um, more obscurely, the template Haskell uh, that, we, that we used in the, um, the classy.hs really has weird effects, and you probably don't want it for your ordinary code. So it's best to isolate that as well. well that's, just, that's more of a minor point. You know, I know you're all more worried about, about personal embarrassment than about uh, whether template Haskell is running in your Haskell code, and I know I am anyway. And uh, that, is, that is all, unless we have uh, some questions. Here are the URLs for stuff. Yeah? Is there some reference for, that tells you like, what order to define your uh, type variables in? Um, so as long as you always add to the beginning, you're pretty much safe. Um, I don't think there's a reference. I, I think the rules that I've given in the... Um, in the, which file was it? Last param. The, the three rules here should cover you for the most part. If you're following these rules, then you should be pretty much set. Um, I don't think there's a reference other than just being aware of what, what type classes are available in, in general use. Anything else? Okay, that's all. Thanks.